This video will talk about the thermal properties of matter, specifically the thermal conductivity, which we've introduced already, and the thermal diffusivity, uh, which you can read about in chapter 2.2 of your text. So here's Fourier's law. We've already mentioned K, the thermal conductivity. It's a property of the material, and it measures how easily heat is conducted or it passes through the material. We mentioned K depends on the material type, the phase, and the temperature. It can also depend on the direction in which heat transfer occurs. So within an anisotropic material, material properties, including K, are dependent on the direction of heat transfer. So K may be different in uh, different magnitude in the X, Y, and Z directions. Wood's an excellent example of a material that's anisotropic with regards to strength. It's strong wind forces are applied along the grain rather than perpendicular to the grain. However, most of the time in this class, we'll only consider isotropic materials such that K is the same in the X, Y, and the Z direction. All right, here we have figure 2.4 in your book that shows the values for various materials at normal temp temperature and pressure, i.e. atmospheric conditions. Um, and as you might have guessed, based upon the fact that according to Fourier's law, the heat transfer rate will decrease if K is lowered, materials with a low thermal conductivity make good insulators because they're poor conductors of heat. Likewise, materials with high thermal conductivity values make poor insulators because they're good conductors of heat. Um, also important to note, materials that conduct heat well conduct electricity well. You'll also notice on the left-hand side that gases have a very low thermal conductivity, um, which makes sense because um, in general, um, as the farther apart that those molecules are, the lower the thermal conductivity. That's why double pane windows are better for restricting heat loss from a house or vice versa. Um, the gas that's trapped between the two or sometimes three glass panes, uh, typically it's argon, but it could be air, although argon has a thermal conductivity about two-thirds that of air, um, that gas acts as a very good insulator. Fibers and foams are good insulator as well, partly due to the fact that there's gas, maybe air trapped between the solid material. Then if we move to the right a little bit more, we see water. While the thermal conductivity is certainly de uh, temperature dependent for water, the thermal conductivity is on the order of magnitude of one watt per meter Kelvin, uh, maybe a little bit less. Often when you're looking at a problem, you treat the thermal conductivity as a constant, even though within a material, if there exists a temperature gradient, there will also be a change in K across the material. Best practice is to just take K at the average temperature of the material. So this is a chart showing the behavior as K as a function of the material type, the phase, and the temperature. And you can see that for solids, which are shown with the solid pink lines, the thermal conductivity does not change that much since there's not much change in the molecular spacing. Your book talks about the mathematical relationships to define thermal conductivity for solids as a function of electron-specific heats, electron velocity, electron mean path, but we won't talk about that here. Um, there's also some discussion about micro and nanoscale effects in which K become, or changes in K become important, but we won't talk about that in this class either. Um, the dependence of K on temperature for liquids is not so clean cut. Yes, the thermal conductivity for liquids is generally smaller than that of solids, um, but you might expect that as the temperature goes up, the spacing would increase and the thermal conductivity would go down. But as we can see, looking at those dashed pink lines on the graph, that the relationship is not that clean. The behavior for water, for example, has an almost parabolic shape to it. So here in figure 2.9 from the text, we can see that the dependence of thermal conductivity on temperature for other liquids is just as strange. Um, those molecular conditions in the liquid state are just not easily described. So what we can take away from this is that while thermal conductivity for liquids is typically lower than that for solids, there's not a general relationship for the dependence of thermal conductivity of liquids on temperature. All right, so when we get to gases, which are shown by these dotted pink lines at the bottom, we know we note that the dependence of K on temperature is not really what we would expect either. You'd think as the temperature goes up, the spacing increases and K would decrease. 
um, but there's a little bit more at work here. Um, the microscopic kinetic energy of those gases increases as the temperature increases, which means more molecular collisions, which means a higher thermal conductivity. Now let's talk about thermal diffusivity. For this, we're gonna use the Greek letter alpha. It's the ratio of uh, the ability of a material to conduct heat versus the ability to store heat. The idea of a material's ability to store heat might cause you to think um, that you would see heat capacity, a heat capacity term somewhere in here, and you would be right. So looking at that ratio, we can see that if the material has a high thermal diffusivity, it'll conduct heat very well, but store it poorly. In other words, those materials respond quickly to changes in the environment. Recall that the specific heat capacity measures how much thermal energy a unit of mass of a material can absorb or store heat before that temperature increases by one degree. So if the thermal diffusivity is high, the denominator is low, and the material can, can't absorb a lot of thermal energy without its temperature increasing. However, if the thermal diffusivity is high, the numerator is large, and the thermal conductivity is high. Therefore, they can conduct heat well or allow it to pass through, if you will. All right, well, um, in the next video, uh, we'll be covering chapter 2.3. We'll start getting to the meat of this chapter, the heat diffusion equation, uh, which is simply an energy balance. Um, so thank you so much for watching and let me know if you have any questions.